thanks again for a, this is what I'm going to call a conversation. It's just fantastic. I leave Master Gardener talks, which are supposed to be talks from educators to educators. So it's a two-way street for sure. I always learn so much from Master Gardener. So thanks again for spending some time with us. I have about 15 minutes, and then I'll make sure that um, Frank has 20 so he doesn't get mad at me. I just wanted to share with you a little bit about some Southern California projects. I'm also videotaping some general PowerPoints that you may find of use for you. You can plug in trees recommended for your climate zone, and I'll also kind of show you some paths for getting there. So thanks for bearing with me while I talk about um, sort of the startup in SoCal, and then uh, you're the ones to best decide where or if you think about something similar up here. Oh, you want me in the picture? <laughs> Frank and the cookies are awfully cute, though, so. I mentioned earlier that we not only have a moisture drought, we also have a tree drought with the lowest per capita tree canopy in the United States here in California of only 108 square yards. Very, very low. I mentioned a little bit about why it has to do with city foresters coming and going based on tax dollars and maybe a poor emphasis and priority structure in our cities. It has to do with shot hole boars in Southern California and other invasive species. And it has to do, as you see in the picture on the right, with not only a lack of street trees that are generally selected, planted, and cared for by the city, but a lack of education that residents that are living, either owning or renting these properties, have taken to heart on tree selection and care. That's where we all come in as educators. So I update the California Drought Monitor in my slides each week. This was uh, released October 13th. Uh, looking at the uh, silver lining, along the coast up here, you're better off, and you usually are, than most areas of the state when it comes to drought. But even then, we have 100% of the state that's suffering some form of drought. So that's the scenario, that's the sad story. 99.8% are suffering moderate drought. That's virtually the whole state. So for further reading, I've published in the last few years with colleagues uh, water requirements of landscape plant studies conducted by UC, and also one on public policy where we talk as much about how we're using the water as related to the waste of the water because it's generally human-induced waste rather than the plants wasting the water. So that's an important message through the Master Gardener program that I know that you teach. So as I mentioned earlier, my opinion, our trees and edibles should come first, even under drought and water restrictions. There's a balance. We share water in urban, ag, and environmental usages, those three general catchments in California. But as master gardeners, the urban water use is something that needs to be balanced with the requirement that trees and edibles have for water. That's water well spent. We can forego our lawns, we can forego our annuals and perennials, but not lawns for recreation, parks and school grounds. So it's not completely black and white, but it is black and white when it comes to, we need to ensure that there's adequate water to preserve our trees and edibles. We have a lot of drought-related resources. I won't dwell on this, but these are all free, instantaneously downloadable publications through your ANR catalog. I'll have these slides available for you, and so you don't have to listen to me droning on on the recording. You can just go to the slides that you're interested in. So the benefits of urban trees are vast. One of the most beneficial, I think, elements 
of what trees really do ecosystem and if you will society wise is to cool urban heat islands and get people outdoors so here's a list that you've seen before besides cooling urban heat islands of course in that process they provide shade they save energy especially if you're parked under a tree or you're in a business shaded by a tree they help clean the air they absorb and store sequester carbon dioxide again that point they do it to a lesser extent of forest trees many benefits reducing glare and reflection in some areas that's a huge facet of benefits they provide habitat for animals and microbes they increase property values they beautify neighborhoods we just had a publication accepted about the society as well as ecosystem benefits of trees and those are vast as well they capture runoff they reduce stormwater flooding they reduce noise in some cases that's really important many many benefits by the way the picture on the right shows a tree that hasn't been topped <laughs> it's irrigated separately from the grass and it doesn't have grass or other vegetation growing up the trunk really really important hard to find these good example pictures very hard here's some research that I talked about before this is Southern California inland and desert locations so they're hotter than here granted so this makes my point with a large red exclamation point side by side with what yes you're fortunate up here not to have the severity of but in the future you also have the footprint of avoiding some of these issues because lessons learned from hotter climates can definitely filter into the Bay Area so uh, I've been measuring using these infrared thermometers surface temperatures this tree on the right with no shade was 165 degree asphalt shaded was 73 degrees this is a huge difference on the left temperatures of black asphalt artificial turf concrete which was much lighter in actuality than it looks there and on the right living turf look at the difference in the living turf and the artificial turf a huge difference double the heat anything living actively growing photosynthesizing is cooling the environment through the release of water vapor back into the air so if we wanted to save a whopping nine percent of the state's water we turn off our outdoor water faucets and spigots and have no landscaping whatsoever and let's have asphalt and black mulch obviously we don't want to do that it's all a balance this is hard to look at but it's the truth southern california booties are required in inland and desert areas if you're trying merely to get your dog carrying him across a parking lot to the dog park with living turf without booties this is the result so it's really up to us as horticulturists to stop these kind of activities that are bearing down so heavily and so negatively on what could be our green viable spaces how would you like to work in let's say a factory where you're parked out here in the back 40 you're walking maybe a fifth of a mile just to get to your cubicle you may not have a view of trees all day you get back home and don't have a tree you look out your apartment window and it's asphalt so this is really bleak and it does bear down on our mental health that's another reason that I think trees need to really rise to the occasion when it has to do with what are we recommending that will improve not only the ecosystem for our trees but also our living and our breathing and our societal environments that we want over time to have enhanced benefits from rather than bleaker ones we talked about this before and on the left literally 
when I was giving to the Western Chapter ISA a lecture on proper tree care for continuing education hours, I heard this chainsaw outside my home. And I went out at lunch and took that picture on the left. So why does this happen? Low bid. I used to live in an HOA. They took the low bid. This tree was topped. So you're losing 20, 25 years of ecosystem benefits if and when that tree fails. It can't provide the shade, can't cool the environment the way that it would had it been treated better. On the right, that's important, right? Make sure that all of those staking ties are removed so they don't cut into the cambium. And the middle is just a great example of a tree canopy that's about 80%. So here's a great paper, The Cost of Maintaining and Not Maintaining the Urban Forest, a review of the urban forestry and arboriculture literature. You might want to pull that down. So just a, a very quick in and out. There's a study at Davis. There's a study at Riverside, both UC campuses, where we've identified through, I mentioned CalADAPT models, what trees that we vetted that we think if we get in the ground today that they're going to prosper over the next 50, 60, 70, 80 years. So we went through quite an intricate selection process. These are the 12 species that you see Riverside. Ten of those are also along the southern coast in Irvine at that plot that we selected to measure over time how they do with the water completely turned off. These are all drought, heat, and relatively pest tolerant. I say relatively because there's no perfect plant. There's no tree that's 100% pest resistant. There just isn't. So here's a picture of what I mentioned, the red push pistachia tree that I just love. It's got this really nice red autumn foliage. It's fruitless, beautiful. It's recommended up here for zones 13, 14, 15, and 16. Here's the websites I mentioned. The select tree is probably the go-to one. And then look at the California Native Plant Society one, but make sure that those that you see that are recommended for the Bay Area are also still recommended under select tree. And then WUCOLs, uh, <laughs> UC has strange acronyms, and here's another one, <laughs> the Water Use Classification of Landscape Species. This one, I think it gets about 13 million hits a year, and that's because the Department of Water Resources has mandated that designers use WUCOLs or something equivalent, there's always that parenthesis, something equivalent to classify water use of these plants before their plans will be approved. So WUCLS has very low, low, medium, and high water use classification categories that the Department of Water Resources and your local water purveyors use. So WUCLS is great to look at the water use classification, but not so great funding and UC goes hand in hand, right, or lack of. So Dave Fergino, who is the manager of WUCLs, has one half-time person. So it's not going to tell you a lot about the species, but it's going to tell you what the state considers their water use to be. So then I would use that, go back to the select tree to kind of um, refine your search. So we've kind of um, skipped around this conversation, but I just wanted to, um, to hit it head on. And that is that we do have, over history, a uh, disparate amount of tree canopy cover in lower income neighborhoods than those with a higher tax base and more money coming into the cities. So in Southern California, we're partnering with the California Climate Action Corps Fellows and Inland Empire Resource Conservation District, ESRI, uh, University of Redlands, and many cities 
to be able to supply trees from the research project that I told you that a lot of us are involved with and showed you pictured of to get these trees in the ground in the underserved low canopy communities. And this is something that I'd love to help jumpstart and have it as a statewide project. I'm recording training that I think is appropriate for the different climate zones. And right now in San Bernardino County, I have a trial project where we're recruiting only master gardeners for this project. And we call it Trees for Tomorrow. They take the whole 18 week master gardener class online and that's required because to be a master gardener and have liability insurance, then you need to make sure that you're fulfilling the statewide master gardener protocol. And I also think it's good that they learn about growing food and they learn about other topics. But when they filled out their application, it was just for this project. So I'm sure there'll be some, some ups and downs in it, but it's a trial balloon. We'll see how it goes. So I want to make sure that you don't hear me trying to say that this is directly cause and effect because it's not but there are correlations. This is beautiful, uh, San Mateo County, Atherton. Sister-in-law lives here. And if you look on the right, look at the percent tree canopy. You can see the yellow. I don't know if you can read the slide, but that's 42 to 90% tree canopy, all right? The darker color is zero to 11%, and that's more in business parks. So the light blue is up to 22%. We'd love to see California tree canopy at at least 25%. So here's a perfect example. Pair that with percentile poverty incidence of only two. Cardiovascular asthmatic incidences very, very low. Pollution relatively low and any water body impairment is zero. So storybook, storybook place to live, storybook place to work, storybook place to be able to interact in general with society. Compare that to San Bernardino. We have a cooperative extension office a quarter mile from this quadrant just the opposite of what we just saw in Atherton. Zero to 11% tree canopy, 99% poverty incidence, high asthma, high cardiovascular disease, a uh, very bleak place to live and work. So these are the neighborhoods we're concentrating our Trees for Tomorrow project in. So, Kudos to our Inland Empire, RCD, and our California Climate Action Corps, and our UCCE Master Gardener team, who are providing long-term education on tree care so that it's not, let's plant a million trees and leave the scene of the crime. <laughs> this is what's so important. This is where you, as master gardeners, really fill in, if you will, the blank spaces and all these tree giveaway programs. It's really, really important that we no longer see these statistics that far more than half the trees are perishing. So I really commend you for thinking forward on what you can do up here. So thanks to all of you for your volunteerism. And that's what I have to say and Frank, you get your 20 minutes. <laughs> the afternoon, this afternoon, what we really want to focus on is what can we do as individuals, sort of a strategy for adapting to the changes that we're seeing in the climate. So let me ask the panelists specifically that. What are things we can do in our own backyards, in our own um, raised beds, in our own uh, flower gardens that can help adapt to these changing conditions we're seeing? <laughs> I 
Me? I see. Uh, well, first thing you can do is cut all your lawns in half. That would be uh, uh, highly recommended. Uh, the second thing you can do is, um, I'm looking for a specific thing in here because it, it relates exactly to what we're talking about. And as usual, I'm somewhat unorganized. You're lucky you don't have to deal with this as one of my students. <laughs> but they're somewhat used to it. Um, so how many of you have heard about permaculture? Wow, nice. Now you guys know that there's 12 principles of permaculture? No? So the 12 principles of permaculture are observe and interact. You guys are doing that as master gardeners. You're observing, you're interacting. Catch and store energy. How does one catch and store energy? Well, put plants in the ground. The fact that we eat sunlight every day is um, indicative of us uh, catching and storing energy. Obtain a yield. You've got to have an ROI. You're not going to do it unless you have an ROI. Return on investment, thank you. Yeah. For those who don't know. <laughs> Were you an accountant at one time, or just? <laughs> I, I, I see. Uh, um, apply self-regulation and accept feedback. Uh, I think you guys do that all the time uh, with your master gardener program, especially when you're talking about working with uh, uh, people who um, uh, the the one who just Kit Young, yep. yeah. You know, she seems like the type of person who uh, researches to the nth degree, as well as some of the others. And her too, yeah. <laughs> um, use, and value, uh, use and value renewable resources and services. Um, so the first law of thermodynamics is nothing is ever lost or uh, uh, it, it just changes. And so when we talk about resources and renewable resources and services, I think that's key in, in understanding what we need to do in our own lives. Produce no waste. That's a hard one. Um, plastics are the biggie. Uh, it drives, so in my classroom, you're not allowed to bring a plastic water bottle in unless you can refill it. So uh, single-use plastic is not allowed in my classrooms. And they get that on the first day. Um, if you were to look at the Pacific gyres, there's, uh, what, eight of them now? The garbage patches out in the Pacific. Uh, it's sad. It's all plastic. And, and so we need to produce no waste. Um, and that's a difficult one. We as a society... Before, and I'll give you an example. Mars. We've trashed it already. How much junk is up on Mars? How much junk is on the moon? How much junk is in space in, in the satellites that are not even being used? So we have a tendency to trash. And then we go in there and try to clean it up. We need to reverse that and clean it up before we trash it. Um, design from patterns to details. So patterns to details, you start with a bigger picture and then you go down to the details. Integrate rather than segregate. To your point on some of the uh, areas that don't have tree canopy in the poorer sections of town, I think that's very, very uh, valuable information. Use small and slow solutions. So the slow food acts, uh, slow food uh, organizations um, trying to get away from this fast food stuff. Use and value diversity. Use edges. So everything is everything happens on the edges. It's not so much things happening in the middle. It's when two differing areas meet. That's where change takes place. And I'm very much interested in the edges. 
So I like the permaculture design principles, and I also like trying to understand some of the principles that come from um, the um, experts in our areas. And one of the ones that I have a, gr a great amount of respect for is Doug Tallamy. If you've never read Doug Tallamy's book on um, Nature's Best Hope, and he's got a brand new one out. It's called Oaks, which is another one. I just ordered Oaks. I haven't read it yet. I'm hoping to get it on uh, Sunday and read it. Um, he has a list of plants, and I'm trying to find that list, of, of the plants that are the best ones for planting because they are eaten by caterpillars. Ah, yeah, here we go. Here we go. That's what I want. So Doug Tallamy, by far and away, says that oaks are the best of the best. They support 534 different kinds of caterpillars. So you need to understand the, the relationship of caterpillars to pollinators. In larval form, these things are eating machines. We all know that. Um, and I really applaud them for that. But when they grow to adult, they are pollinators. Birds rely on caterpillars. Our bird count this year is down again. So I have a good friend. She uh, has her doctorate in uh, ornithology. And she comes out here every year and does the bird counts. And this year was one of the worst. Part of it is because we're losing habitat. Part of it is, is that uh, this, this heat is not doing well with, uh, with the birds. So oak, number one, Quercus. Any kind of Quercus. Put an oak in the ground. Number two, and this might surprise you, black cherry. Prunus, 456 um, types of Lepidoptera rely on black cherry. That's huge. Number three, Salix, willow trees, 455. Birch, a short-lived tree, 413. And of course, birch is a pretty heavy water user, so it may be not be one of the ones that we would put in, in a drought environment. Mollus, crab apple, 311 different types of butterflies. Blueberry, vicinium, vicinium ovatum. Maple, anything maple. Pines, hickory, crotagus, hawthorn, rose family. Alders, basswood, ash, and the lowest one is chestnut with 125 species of uh, butterflies and moss. On the herbaceous plant side, now this one surprised me, goldenrod. I know, see? A lot of people are. 115 different butterflies and moss depend on soldago. Number two, Asters. The Asteraceae family is the largest uh, family by far and away. What is it, about 40% is asters? Yeah, it's up there. Um, 112 different butterflies and moths depend on it. Helianthus is number three. Sunflowers. So plant sunflowers. Joe Pie or Eupatorium. And a lot of people don't like that plant. It's Joe Pye weed, 42 different uh, butterflies and moths. Morning glory. I know. Everybody hates morning glory, right? Uh, there are 39 different butterflies and moths that rely on it. Sedges. Sedges have edges. Carex. Uh, pretty high up there, uh, 36. Honeysuckle, lo uh, Lonicera. 36. 
any kind of lupin. See, everybody likes lupin. <laughs> Morning glory. No, 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 no. Lupin, yeah, I'll take lupin. 33. Violets, 29. Geraniums. Now, you need to know the difference between geraniums and pelagoniums. There's a difference. And if you don't know the difference, that's your homework today. <laughs> Geranium. Black-eyed Susan, Rudbeckia, 17. Iris. And these are the bearded iris, not the California native Doug iris. It's uh, 17. Uh, milkweed. Yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> Darling of the industry just lately. It's low. It's 12. It's 12. So should we be focusing on milkweed? Should all the attention be on milkweed? I'm not a big fan of uh, focusing on the monarchs. I like monarchs, but there's others that are out there that deserve the same consideration of the monarchs. And so why focus on milkweed when you can get so many other different varieties of butterflies in your garden? Um, that's what my focus is. Verbena, 11. Penstemon, long-lived long plant, 50 years you'll get out of a penstemon. Eight different uh, butterflies or, uh, or moss. Phlox is eight. Bee balm, Mornarda is seven. Veronica and cardinal flower, Lobelia, uh, six. So this is from, uh, from Doug Tallamy's book, and his point is... He has two points. He's looking for believers. We've got to believe that we can change the system, and that's exactly what you said this morning, in, in that this afternoon is more about the positive. We need to go at this in a positive manner and be a believer. If we believe we can change it, we can change it. And it doesn't have to be an army of people. It can be one or two or five. It just needs to be believed and you gotta have the goals out there and you just gotta make it happen. And, and Master Gardener Program is a perfect organization to do this because you're very active in what you do. You're very concerned about what's going on. You're here. What are you about? 50, 60 of you here today? That's a big turnout, in my opinion. And you, 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 you want to know the answers, and so you read books, and you try to understand what you can do to make a change. And so I believe that, that um, you as an organization can be the groundswell that makes this stuff happen. You know, I was talking with this gentleman during the break, and he was saying, well, how do we get rid of this stigma that invasive species happen? Because we've named them invasive species, and that frightens us. And so we need to look at our language. Words do hurt. The other part of this thing is that I only plant natives, natives to planet Earth. And that's where our focus needs to be. Natives to planet Earth. They're all natives. They didn't come from another planet. They're native to this planet. Why are we focusing on one type of natives? Let's focus on what works and help the plants um, save us, essentially. That's my 20 minutes. Just uh, thank you. That was great, Frank. Getting back to your empowerment as agents of University of California, one thing that over the course of my almost 39 years in a &R, that if I could turn the pages backward, I'd do. And I've been doing a lot of soul searching, and I want to share with you three things that I wish I would have done when I was 26 with my uh, slideshow from my graduate degree, still hot, 
hoping I wouldn't upset the carousel. Remember those days? <laughs> Most of you are sort of my age, so it was flying from Minnesota to Southern California with what I thought was this God sent slide set. You know, is the top on right? Are they going to fall out? So, getting this job, I was so eager to. First of all, learn plants of California. I had this, oh my God, why did they hire me? I've never lived in California. I don't know these plants. So it was focused on me more than those we serve. So very quickly, because that's very humbling, when one of our statewide uh, plant pathologists called me as a joke, and I didn't know, you know who he was, he called me my second day on the job, and. He said, you know, something's wrong with this almond tree I have. And I, I said, could you spell that? <laughs> A-L-M. And my boss is standing outside my door, and I'm thinking, pack your bags, take your carousel, head back to Minnesota. So lots of humbling experiences like that we've all had. But as far as change makers that you all are, recruiting from these communities in which change most needs to happen is a key. And it's not people that look like me, of my nationality and my age group, knocking on the door of a community I've never lived in, I've never really socialized in, and telling them, you see at your service, we're here. That's probably the biggest lesson that I think that I've learned is people don't give a DA blank blank about where you're coming from if you don't ask them what their needs are. So in Southern California, we've watched master gardeners being recruited from communities we've never been able to reach. We've had programs there for 38 years suddenly we look more like those that we're here to serve. So I don't mean to lecture you, I'm just telling you that I wish if I could flip pages back that that would have been my mindset. I'm done. <laughs> okay, in some ways that touches on one of my next questions. You know, we're all very much interested in what we can do today, tomorrow, ourselves. But we're also sort of ambassadors out with the general public. What are the, the key things you think we need to convey to the general public in order to adapt to the things that are, are changing? Well, reduce the use of pesticides. Um, if you go to the big box stores and look at that wall of, of uh, pesticides, it's unimaginable that these things are uh, being used. Um, I have, uh, I teach an integrated pest management class, uh, 13 weeks, 12 weeks, uh, and, and of course 13th week is the final. And three of my students were going into the big box stores and photographing all the chemicals and using the environmental impact quotient, which isn't a great model, but it's an okay model. I'm sure you're familiar with it. Um, to categorize these uh, pesticides. Well, um, they got caught on camera and they were thrown out of the store. So they went to the next big box store. Well, they had their pictures and they wouldn't let them in. So the big box stores need to change and somebody needs to educate them on how they can change. Why isn't Big Box holding seminars like this on pesticide and pesticide use? Because they sell them. Because it's a business model. Um, everybody know about the yellow LED light bulbs? Change your light bulbs to yellow LEDs. Anybody know why? Uh-uh. You're killing bugs. You're killing um, moths with the brighter lights. Change to a yellow LED, and the moth population will increase significantly. Something small like that. 
Master gardeners ought to box those up and put, put uh, your name on it and give them away. Yeah? Um, oppose mosquito spraying. That's a tough one. Why aren't they using Bacillus thuringiensis instead of the chemicals that they're putting out there? BT works. You can get mosquito dunks at any hardware store, and they do work instead of uh, the spray that they're using. Uh, don't use bug zappers. That's an obvious one. Use keystone plants. Uh, cut your lawn in half. Oh, plant for specialist bees. So as I said, um, Gordon Franke uh, does the bee project over in Berkeley, Dr. Franke. Uh, and he has a garden over there that is specific to native bees. And he uh, has a website that's excellent. Go to his website and look at the kinds of plants that he's putting in there. If you're doing uh, uh, veggies, you need pollinator plants also. And so pair your veggies with pollinator plants. Bring in the pollinators and bring in the bees. Uh, that's really, um, uh, really an important one. And he's got a great book uh, out also on, uh, on the bees. It's called Bloom. Uh, so uh, pick up Dr. Franke's book. By the way, um, those of you who are former students of mine know Frank's rules on buying books. Yes? I heard a yes in the back. Yes. Some people listen to me. You buy one and you give two away. Two away. And the reason is that books take a huge amount of water to produce. Last year, one company, publishing company in Oregon, cut down one million trees to publish their books. We can't afford to lose any more trees. So you need to want that book to buy it. And we want to minimize the amount of, of um, books that are brand new. We want to pass these books around. So you buy one, give two away. Uh, and I have a real hard time with that. Uh, I, I really do. I, I recently gave away 250 books. I'm a voracious reader. And, I, and, and so I, uh, I, I just had to clean out my, my uh, collection. So uh, books. Um, Let's see what else I have on my list here. Leave leaf litter under your plants. Don't blow it away. Um, oh yeah, BT. Um, plant meadows. Um, meadows are really good habitat places. And they're a really nice interface uh, between wild areas and, uh, and the urban environment. Um, I don't know. Those are some of the things that I would recommend that we do on a, on a local level. If, if nothing else, buy a yellow light bulb uh, and start there. Uh, and make sure it's a LED, yellow LED light bulb. And change that thing uh, at your door to a yellow LED and uh, keep the, the, the bug population high. We like bugs. We do. Jan, do you have suggestions for things we could tell the public? I, my suggestion is the third thing I've learned, and that is talk less and listen more. So I would love to open up the discussion okay. to whatever you guys want to talk about, if that's OK, if that's you're not going off the agenda. It's very timely. I was getting ready to make that move. <laughs> Myself. Okay. Please continue to text your questions or whatever. We'll start with the text questions first. Um, this person said, um, the situation I'm seeing are homeowners who've transitioned from lawn to mulched natives 
are going back to lawns because the natives become too weedy and mowing was easier. Comment? Yeah, it's a matter of maintenance. These same people want to get a garden janitor to maintain those properties. And garden janitors do not have a clue on how to manage natives. Where do pollinator-friendly habitats come in the watering hierarchy? My, just to repeat the question, how important are pollinator habitats when I was mentioning that trees and edibles should come first? Yes, and edibles and trees can promote habitats, <coughs> so that would be the hierarchy to look at that. And that doesn't mean to throw out the baby with the bathwater. When we talk about prioritizing under drought and water restrictions, those two groups of plants, it just means that Frankly, if we're losing our trees, the opportunity cost of decades is just too high a price to pay. And many of the trees support the habitat. So when you're looking through those search engines, then you definitely want to pay a lot of attention to those that promote healthy habitat. And edibles as well. Many edibles are habitat gardens. A lot of herbs are. So I think that it's looking at the whole picture. And, and, and plant using tree guilds. So if you're using tree guild style planting, you're establishing, I mean, let's just take a, a very simple example, an apple tree guild. What plants that you can plant in and around an apple tree will support that apple tree? And as many edibles as you can get in there as you can, it would be great. So leguminaceae or fabiaceae, they sequester or they uh, produce nitrogen. That goes in your guild. Yarrows, they attract beneficials. That goes in your guild. So you're not planting mutually exclusive, just one kind of tree, and uh, it doesn't have anything around it. Use plants as living mulch. I heard the word three sisters today. Did you know that there's four? Do you remember? You are. You are the fourth sister. Does this happen in the wild? No, it does not. There's four sisters. When you're doing these kinds of tree gilding, think about synergy and what kinds of plants are going to help all of the other plants in this system thrive. And that includes bringing in the pollinators. Just because we're in a drought situation doesn't mean that plants can't be living mulch. They can't have more than one purpose because they can. Um, and that's how you set up your planting systems. I hope you don't take offense to this, but it drives me crazy when I go someplace and I see a raised planter bed and it's a monoculture. There's just one crop in there. You got to you've got to diversify your cropping systems. One of the worst things that happens in the state of California is the almond groves. They're horrible. They're, they're food deserts for bees. They truck these bees in from South Carolina, North Carolina, South Carolina, a million hives. Let them loose in the almond fields for six weeks. And, and then they pack them back up and take them back to South Carolina. Well, if you're a bee and you're making a five-day trip on the back of a semi-truck, um, not good. And it's the same with our small uh, gardens. Diversify that garden. Get your pollinators in there. Don't be afraid to mix nasturtiums, uh, which is an edible plant, in with your, uh, with your uh, squash. You know, be the fourth sister and make up the three sisters as you go along. It doesn't have to be beans, squash, and corn. Set, set your own. Thank you. Can, can you talk about Tree City and Arbor Day and the local habitat restoration, uh, similar to what's happening at Pacific Beach Coalition? Can anybody address that? I don't know anything about it. OK. Yeah, this is a question for me. Um, I lived in Pacifica two years ago. We uh, you know, were talking about planting trees, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so uh, uh, Tree City Pacifica, uh, there is uh, uh, Arbor Day Association that has tree cities all around the U.S. And 
two years ago, Pacifica became a Tree City uh, USA member, and we've had this is our third Arbor Day coming up in about two weeks. Where nice. We plant around 50 trees, you know, in the community, and it's something that seems obvious that that the gardeners could get involved with because yeah. it's involving planting trees. Yeah, and I love that. about the exact same thing about the right tree in the right place, and this is a whole new concept about think about the right tree 60 years from now, which is really what you have to do. So mm -hmm. I love that concept. And one, the other thing I'll talk and say is uh, habitat restoration. The Beach Coalition is very active doing habitat restoration. Uh, Lindemar Beach, for instance, was 100% ice plant 25 years ago, and now there's virtually zero, and they're all made of plants. And I, I take your point, they were literally ripping out Caltrans buckwheat wasn't native to yeah. the beach and planting the native version of buckwheat. So you can get too far with that whole problem. Yeah, uh, unintended consequences. So that was a lot. So I'm going <laughs> to direct direct uh, questions to you, Jeff, if people want to uh, know more about the, the, the Arbor Day Pacifica coalition and your restoration projects well, for, for the, the folks in san francisco of course there's friends of the urban forest right. yeah. and uh, of course down in los angeles you have tree people right and canopy right. in palo alto right. and menlo park right uh, an urban forest in san jose we have a meeting next week this will be real quick with uh, i'm on the california urban forestry advisory council for caltrans and you'll be happy to know that there's about 500 million more dollars than in previous years for tree planting projects. So next week, um, we're moving forward how those might be made available. And personally, of course, the emphasis I'm going to state that should be hand in hand is the maintenance in, and therefore master gardeners play a big picture in the rollout of that. So as you see that coming out of the coffers for grants, then I'd be happy to help lead a statewide effort I did talk to uh, the president of California Relief, Cindy Baines, who will be there. And I talked to her about how master gardeners were the perfect vehicle, and I'd be happy statewide to help structure this. And Missy at the statewide office is really into this as well, so that we could have some pilot projects. And this might be a perfect one, because I'm really impressed with your passion and engagement already on this topic. So any way that we can help further this with grants, then please email me. And Relief is a great program. Isn't it? Yeah. 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 yeah very, very well done. Yeah. Okay, we've got a lot of questions. So uh, there is, a, they'd like you to speak to the advantages of cover crops and leaving roots in raised beds for soil health and carbon cycling. Uh, using using uh, plants as cover crops, is that what you're saying? Uh, the advantages of cover crops and then leaving roots in raised beds when you're moving on to the next Well, co cover crops. crops are a must, and, and you should be doing crop rotation also. So, um, so cover crops um, are there for a number of reasons, and leaving the roots in the ground uh, helps uh, bring carbon back to that soil drops organic matter in there. Everything happens at the root zone. I mean, that's the rhizosphere. All the bacteria are there, all of the fungi are there. That's where the big party is. And so the more you can emphasize the big party, the, the healthier your soil is going to be. You need to rejuvenate that soil. And so uh, by leaving all of the roots in, you're not destroying that soil food web, you're, all, you're enhancing it. So I, I'm, a, I'm a big proponent of leaving it in. Okay. And using plants as cover crops are much better than mulch, in my opinion. Uh, most people use the wrong kind of mulch, especially in your veggie beds. Uh, you gotta have something that the bacteria wanna eat, you know, rice straw, something like that, uh, instead of uh, wood chips. Wood chips is fungal food. Um, quickly, do you know where to buy the yellow LED lights? Uh, I was getting mine down at a, a local light store, and they, they were carrying them. Uh, what was the name of that store? I don't remember. And Ace Hardware has them. Yeah, Ace has got them. Ace is the place, by the way.
What do you think about the idea that individuals growing their own edibles may not be sustainable? Look at Israel. No home veggie gardening as it's more sustainable to grow on farms, so they say. Well, I'll, since I was mentioning that, I'll take a first stab. Again, it's not either or. It's, it does take a village, but when you look at the footprint of growing food locally, I'd love to see community and, and master gardening you know, activities in school gardens too, because in California, in San Mateo, San Francisco counties, you're so compact that you have the perfect vehicle to grow food locally. And I think that you can also minimize the use of pesticides that way on a smaller scale. And you can also maximize the biodiversity. So that, that's my take on it. Hmm. I'm not sure about that question. I think I'll pass on that. All right. Well, there, there are more. So UC Davis did a study planting a quarter mile wildflower meadows between almond groves and yield increased. Why can't UC require almond growers to do this? Well, it's private property. Can't, can't do it. Uh, they used to diversify planting in grapevines and they're not doing that anymore. Uh, we're losing a lot of our, our pollinators because the pollinator uh, plants are not being used in areas where they should be used. You know, an almond field is a perfect location. Why do you want to truck bees in from South Carolina when you can just keep those bees fed? And by the way, almond is a very good bee food. Uh, it's got a lot of good stuff for, for bees. Uh, but geez, you're only feeding them for six weeks. If, if you would uh, uh, cover crop, and the big reason they don't do that is because they harvest with machinery. And it makes it much more difficult to harvest. Uh, unfortunately, they're going for maximum yield. So an interesting story, uh, I'm going to take a little time here, uh, as you always. When the settlers first came into this area and observed the first people who were harvesting rice, they noticed that they didn't harvest all the rice. They left some of it. And we said, why are those savages doing that? What a waste. They, the savages, knew that they didn't own that part of the rice. It's part of the honorable harvest. You don't take the first, you don't take the last. That doesn't belong to you. It is brilliant, isn't it? Yeah. So how do you manage, or how is uh, the maintenance of city trees managed? Oh, wow. Well. We can both go It's on not, all day. should we just say it's not? The, the, well, the, Some good, the, bad numbers. Yeah, the, again, it mm. depends on if the city has a city forester or arborist yeah. largely as far as street trees, that's where the buck stops. So tree species planted and cared for at the level that they should be is really what's gonna carry that on. But the rest of the landscapes really comes back to education such as provided by master gardeners. No, but, I'm sorry. Go okay, ahead. I, I asked that question. Okay. okay. The Lord talked about, the Lord organization is going into the city, but we protect it because we are best for the city. So the question is, yeah. still are trees in front of it, but not a lot of them are being maintained. Yeah. I, I think that's the whole point here. here. So yeah. It's not that you're trees that you really have to take care of. That's, that's right. What's the point? That's what I hope you're hearing loud and clear. That's what we're echoing over and over. Don't plant, you know, plant a million trees is useless. I'd rather see 500 trees planted and maintained correctly. So if that's the message that we're not getting out, then hear it loud and clear that don't plant any tree unless you have a maintenance plan. I think a lot of these cities don't understand the return of investment of a tree. It that's might cost right. you $80 a year to manage one tree but you're going to get $126 in ecosystem services back. Yeah. And they don't have that calculation. Was that on iTree? Yeah, and it's in I that publication was... too. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you can look at the uh, yeah. return of investment dollar-wise if you plant a tree and maintain it correctly. 
there's actually a dollar value that you can yeah. fix to that. And yeah. cities need to understand that. Sometimes they forget and don't understand that. Advisors like myself are actually hired where about 90% of our job is to provide training to mm -hmm. city arborists. So we go around and then probably train, I don't know, I think I train about 8,000 arborists a year. And so at these, we, they have big conferences, they need to come for CEUs just like you do. But it's not so much, I'm singing to the audience there because who attends? Those that are accredited. So who doesn't attend? Those that need most to hear this. So it gets back to, it takes all of us working together at the community level where you have inroads to that local government. That's what's really gonna be the change. Right, um, I just, uh, on a side, I, I talked to Igor about this very issue because I'd driven down streets of San Francisco and seen our urban forest trees planted with their signs and poorly planted, dying, not maintained, et cetera, et cetera. And he said that the turnover in the landscaping business is just phenomenal and you just can't keep people trained um, properly. And uh, so I agree that you have to complain to the city, the local city officials and be a voice. And I hope we have a group of master gardeners who get involved in tree, trees here in our county. That's a plan. Okay, so the next question is, what can be done about the warming environment demanding more moisture from our plants? Uh, we don't know. We don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> I don't know. Hmm. Okay, well, let's go on to the next. What are thoughts on installing uh, rain gardens or green stormwater infrastructure during drought years? Got to plant the rain. Yeah, you know, you, you see a lot of these houses who attach piping to their gutters, uh, their rain gutters on the roof, and where does that water go? It goes to the sewer. They're treating uh, rainwater as wastewater by choice, and they've got to get that, keep that water on property. You know, put in a dry well. Uh, plant a rain garden. If you want a great book, there's one by Brad Lancaster on rainwater harvesting. He's out of Arizona. Uh, he's done talks in this area. He's very good, very smart. And he has a concept of planting the rain. And it works. It works. Instead of that water going into the gutter, as does a lot of our rainwater, we've got to figure out how to keep it on property and move it around using rocks to slow it down, using plants to pick it up, digging deeper holes so th that the, the water uh, gets picked up. And a lot of cities are doing this. They're pl putting in rain gardens. I'm not saying they're doing it right, but at least the concept is there and they're thinking about it. But Brad Lancaster's got a great book on, on rainwater harvesting if you, you wanna learn how to do it. The other thing real quick, and I, I showed a slide of the uh, publication on gray water. Mm -hmm. So now it's yeah. legal. You can just tap into your washing machine and a household of four can keep eight trees irrigated. That's so great. yeah, it's in that publication. I won't dwell on that now. Nice point. So I hope I'm not repeating myself because my brain was somewhere else when you said that, Janet, but I wanted to say that um, the new house I moved to on the coast, uh, my washing machine is right next to the front wall of my house. I have um, tubing out my window and I water my front yard with my washing machine. And that's my gardening day and it's looking great. It's looking great. A lot of <laughs> a nice diversity of plants growing, flowering. Um, yeah, and you would not believe the gallons of water that your washing machine is using. Oh yeah. Uh, 20 gallons, 20 gallons a load, maybe. Wow. Rinse and uh, wash and rinse. Okay, um, in terms of letting the weeds grow, do you know if wild purslane is a good one? Well, purslane is edible, for one thing. It's a very nice ground cover, it has a beautiful flower. Uh, it's a living mulch. I mean, what, what, what could be wrong with it? Uh, as are a lot of the, the so-called herb sauvages in our area. I'm a big one on plantain. I love plantain. I think it has a beautiful flower. The leaves are uh, stunning. Uh, wildlife love it. 
uh, birds love the seeds. Pollinators hit it. So uh, uh, those are just two examples of herbs sauvage that you could use. Yeah. Uh, the question is, um, Anne is collecting rainwater from an asphalt roof. Is that water harming her vegetables? So the first rain of any uh, season is a disaster. Um, the rubber from our tires on our cars, the, uh, the antifreeze that dumps out of our radiators in the parking lots, all of the chemicals that are on the ground go into our uh, sewer system, and it's a disaster. The amount of chemical that's on your roof is difficult to measure, but you can put a, uh, a first rain diverter and get rid of those chemicals, uh, uh, most of them. You're going to still have a few up there, but not much. Plants are what are called hyper, hyper accumulators. They will actually, uh, some will clean water. Sedges are an excellent uh, plant for cleaning water. So you can actually run the, that water through a little bit of a, 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 a I guess, a... Um, a uh, small creek bed with sedges in it and eventually get it to your vegetables if you're really concerned about that. If you're totally concerned about it, plant squash because squash will pull the chemicals out of the ground and then put plants in and around the squash that you're going to eat. Don't eat the squash <laughs> if that is really bothersome to you. But I would trust the rainwater coming off my roof. I, I wouldn't worry about it. Any other comments from the speakers or Nick? Oh, Carol, I'm sorry, Carol. How much can you get to eat, actually get to eat from, um, what does the tree take on, kills? How many, how much, well, it really depends on the kinds of plants that you're putting in there. So up at Foothill College, we have a small garden up there uh, apple trees, and then we have a, a number of plants in and around that it, that we're using as a guild. Uh, we've got tagetes, the bush tagetes. We've got euphorbia. We've got mints, yarrows, milkweed, uh, and I'm probably forgetting a few. Uh, and we pulled out of that garden this year about 450 pounds of produce. And it's a small garden. And 50 square feet. Well, you'd be su uh, surprised how much food you can pull out of a small oh, I area. I am, but, yeah. But um, not with, what is it called? A tree guild? A tree guild. If I planted a tree guild there, no broccoli, no cauliflower, no carrots, no. No, you could, you could still grow those same. In the same quantity? Oh, absolutely. But you're interplanting with other plants that are synergistic. So shoot me an email and I'll send you my take on crop rotations, uh, on that, on, on all that works, and some information I have on tree guilds. Okay. Or, or recommend a good book. Uh, well, there's actually a lot of information on the online. If you just plug in tree guilds, uh, there's tons of information on there. There's one, uh, the, is it called the Resilience? Alliance, I think it's called the Resilience Alliance. They have a, t a lot of information about tree guilds. Yeah, and uh, is it Holmgren, David Holmgren? Uh, he, he mentions uh, tree guilds in his books. All right, so I think we're going to bring the um, afternoon session to a close. I'd like to give both our panelists an opportunity for a few closing sentences. Thank you so much yeah. for engaging with us today. Big round of applause to you. <laughs> yeah.